Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see so many people here. Uh, what Robert Winston was talking about standing on this stage this morning struck a chord with me because especially his story and, and the, uh, the film with the, uh, with the gymnast and talking about how she visualised uh, the, the, the visualisation bit. But, the, but the, the key thing that came out of that for me was the importance of practice. And uh, I'm going to touch on that to a certain extent just in my, in my first... Uh, in my first little slot of time here. But we're, we're really talking about embedding learning. That's what uh, the whole of this, this session is about. It's about embedding and extending learning beyond the formal. I rather like this, this photograph because although we might think it teaches, something, teaches us something about uh, the Scots and the kilts, it's actually a, a, this is a team of people in, uh, in Canada rather than in Scotland. Uh, I want to just touch on extending learning into the work, into work. And I think that there are a number of ways. Well, there are a number of ways in which we can do it. We can add learning to work, which is where we simply extend the learning that we do, where we have structured programs, courses, whatever, and extend those into, into work. And anyone who's worked in any leadership development programs or any uh, many, many programs will already do this, where we we ensure that, that people maybe do pre-work before they come in and then they, do, then they come into a, a program and then they do something further on. That's still learning focused. It's actually really focused around the learning process. But beyond adding learning to work, we have embedding learning with work, which starts a significant change because it's starting to think about being performance focused. And then we have extracting and sharing learning from work. And this is all around uh, how we, everything from, might be from storytelling to microblogging to all sorts of social learning aspects where we're, in fact, focused on performance and focused in terms of how we extract and share learning to work. So what I'm going to focus on is the embedding learning within work piece. And I'm going to flick through just a few key points, key points, I think, and then, then dive down a little bit more. But... If we think about how a grandmaster learns or how a gymnast learns, and we can see that people who have become really top performers, really exceptional performers, will learn through having plenty of experience, rich and challenging experiences. A grandmaster, no one becomes a chess grandmaster without playing thousands of games. Of course, a grandmaster will know the theory, they'll read all the books, they'll study games from, that other people have played, but they have lots and lots of experience and masses of practice. And they'll reflect on that practice and they'll share with other people. Now, actually, it doesn't matter whether you're a grandmaster, a chess, or whether you're a great gymnast, or whether you're uh, a manager of a team, uh, it might be a, a tech team or whether you're doing whatever, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Those principles still apply. That a lot of what we learn, we learn as part of, of the work. And one of the rationales for embedding learning in work is that work is more like a jazz band than a marching band. And in fact, the concept of curriculum was developed by the Prussians in, 18, in the 18th century as an offshoot, well, as part of the military process of structuring to ensure that everyone did the same thing. So that when military lined up, they all lined up in the same way and they marched to the same drummer. But in fact, the way that organizations work, now whether they're hierarchical organizations or structured organizations or innovative organizations, they're much more like a jazz band than a marching band. So we need to think about our learning and reflecting that fact, the fact that New challenges come up every day. The fact that we can't anticipate things all the time. We can't prepare everything in advance. Because there are some things that we just, we just don't know what are going to happen. So although we can prepare people to a certain extent, and particularly when people come into an organization or when they start in a new role, we can do certain things around helping them develop. We can't predict down to the task level in terms of what's going to, what challenge they're going to face every day. And it really, I, I've been, astounded over the years when I look at content 
of structured learning, a lot of it's around task stuff. And, and please don't get me started talk, uh, talking about training people on systems and processes. And I've seen so many millions and millions of pounds, dollars, yen, and so on wasted, where people are trained on a new CRM system is rolled out. So everyone is trained before the system's rolled out, and they're trained right down to task level as to where you click here and there, and no one remembers anything, or they remember very little until they use it the first time. When they use it the first time, they turn to the person beside them and they say, Tristan, can you, have you done this? Can you tell me how to do it? And if Tristan hasn't done it, I might ask someone else and then I'll call the help desk and then maybe four, to, you know, four steps down the line, I might pull off the, that bit of shelfware that was given to me in the training session six weeks ago and uh, I'll do a bit of trial and error. So uh, embedding learning in work and getting learning close to work is really critical because the, the basis of it is that actually and Robert Winston sort of touched on this right through his talk this morning, is that learning is enhanced by context. We really need to bring the context of how we're going to use what we learn as close as possible as we can to the learning process. And that's really critical. I love this guy's, this guy's work who works all over. He's done some great stuff in London as well. Uh, but, but context is really crit critical, and we've got a lot of evidence that context really impacts learning. And this bit of uh, uh, research here from the, uh, the, the uh, Corporate Executive Board mm. showed that they analyzed a, a large number of learning activities and found that those learning activities that are integrated into the manager and the employee workflow have far greater impact on improvement in performance and those activities that are distinct events and separate from day to day have less impact. And in fact, it's, it's a really significant number. Here's the, the top level figures here, where uh, they looked at those people who were engaged in learning in the workplace, uh, the, the, the data was around at least 11 times in the last month where they were reflecting on what they'd learned and, and how they were learning through work. And they found that the impact was a three times uplift in terms of performance and a two and a half times, a bit over two and a half times uplift in performance and in employee engagement. So not only does performance go up, but employee engagement goes up. And I often say when I'm talking to HR directors and HR teams, if you want to move your employee engagement needle up a little bit, forget about doing all the, the fluffy stuff. Just make sure that your managers support their people to learn in context in the workplace and embed learning in the workplace because that will give you a lift of, you know, not just a couple of percent, but it'll give you huge lifts. And other research, Burson and Associates, Burson by Deloitte has now uh, did some work in 2012 that again showed that organizations with strong informal learning capabilities, and they went on to say specifically or particularly with social using social learning were three times more likely to excel at uh, talent development in terms of developing their, their workforce than organizations without that, those competencies. So again, thinking about how we learn in work uh, and as part of the context, which really brings to, to the, the model I've been working with for 16 years now, uh, the 70-20-10 model, which I usually describe as an approach to extend learning to improve performance. I, I, I've spent more of my waking hours than I'd care to think of uh, telling people or explaining that it's not, not about the numbers. It's actually a reference model. It's a way to think differently about how we help development to occur. And uh, Adam uh, Weisblatt did this little, uh, I was doing some work for Nielsen and uh, the big uh, information company in the States. And uh, Adam works there and he did this little cartoon that's supposed to be me, me with the glasses and the, the bald head. Uh, saying uh, it's not, you know, it's only 65%. Well, it's not the numbers. It's actually about, about how we think of extending learning. And I was talking to someone yesterday here uh, from Schneider, I think it was, who said they're using this model, but they call it the same way, the same, uh, uh, use the same terminology that Cisco use, which is the three E's. They talk about experience, exposure, education. How we learn through experience, how we learn through exposure to other people, and how we learn through education, through structured learning. Other, other organizations use the three Ps, the people, practice, and programs, and various other things. So the framework, the, the, the model is really about how we can extend learning into the workflow. Why should we want to do that? Well, 
all the evidence I've seen, or a vast, an increasing amount of evidence I've seen over the last 15 to 16 years, is that the closer to work that we learn things, the more impactful that is. And this little diagram here, which simply shows moving from what are called point solutions, solutions, in other words, learning away from work into embedding learning in the continuous, continuously in the workflow, and moving from the 10, the structured, into social and, and experiential learning, the, the realized value that we can create is greater than, uh, it, it's greater as we go outward, so to speak. Uh, the, the little box in there is a model of a guy called Joe Raylan, who, if you haven't read his work-based learning book, I would really recommend it. He is an, an academic in the States and has written some really, really tremendous stuff about workplace learning. In fact, I'm just uh, finishing writing a book uh, with a, a couple of Dutch colleagues, which is a lot of it's based around the work that he's done. But it's not my idea. This isn't sort of come out of my head. If you look back to 10 years ago, IBM uh, Consulting developed this model. And you'll see, you'll recognize the similarity. They talked about three phases. They talked about the access phase to learning, where learning is actually separate from work. And again, the realized value, sure, no one's going to dis structured learning. Structured learning really works well in certain situations. It's just not the, not the only tool in the toolkit. As they moved out to the integration phase, where learning is actually enabling work, uh, where we're moving into blended learning, where we're moving into to what I'd call adding learning to work, essentially, that gives us greater realized value. Then move to, as IBM called it, the on-demand uh, phase, uh, which, I would, which I would refer to as embedding learning with work and sharing learning with work and extracting learning from work. We get to this opportunity to really align much more closely with, with business, with business strategy, and we get the opportunity to do that. So if we think about high, how high performers actually reach the heights, I think you can break it down in, this is a very simplistic uh, <coughs> model, I guess, but we can break it down into these fine five different ways. Pretty well every, everyone who is a high performer, no matter what area of expertise they have or where they work, they will have exploited structured development to get the basics. You know, having a really good, solid induction program as someone moves into an organization or into a role is really critical. I, I always thought that uh, one needed to do that in a very structured way uh, in terms of a really good induction program. I thought that was always essential until I uh, uh, wrote a case study for the world's, one of the world's largest tech companies who was simply giving their, they did a trial where they simply gave their, some new inductees to their sales force uh, iPads with all the material they needed on it and got those, those people to get together once a week over coffee to discuss what they were doing and they did a, a control group which went through the standard, uh, the standard induction program. Then after nine months they analysed what was happening and they found that the group that had been through the standard production, the standard induction programs, actually their sales were figures were up a little bit on the others. But when they looked at the, the uh, customer satisfaction, the CSAT figures, the customer satisfaction figures for the group that had learned informally, so to speak, were miles high, miles higher than the other ones. So that sort of questioned my, uh, my theory that you actually needed a good induction solid structured induction program, but be that as it may, we pretty well all learn through that. That's, that's through some sort of structured program. That, that's the 10 bit coming in. Then high performers almost invariably have had hundreds of hours of practice under guidance. One of the great disappointments in my 40 years living in the UK is watching the apprenticeship schemes slowly disappear over consecutive governments because that, to me, is an absolutely superb way in which we help people learn, get to build high performance. You know, apprenticeship is based around instruction and practice under guidance. Then thirdly, every high performer will be embedded in a professional community with their colleagues, uh, their mentors, their support and approach. And, and, and Robert Winston said something uh, earlier on, which I tweeted because there's uh, Jerome Brunner, who's my 
one and only guru in this area. He's turns 100, still working at the University of New York. Uh, Jerome Brunner, great constructivist. Uh, Brunner once said, our world is others. We actually don't exist without others and therefore we don't learn without others, we don't operate without others. And actually organisations are increasingly, very few of us achieve our annual objectives when we go in for our performance appraisals and I'm sure most of us go in on a one-to-one -one basis and we all get appraised individually, but we all know that we don't achieve our objectives by ourselves, we achieve them with colleagues, we achieve them with other resources. So every high performer, every one of us, will have developed to what we can do through and with others. So that's the 20 bit. High performers also have access to on the job performance support. In other words, they know where to get the right information, who to contact. They know where, where the wherewithal to get their job done is located and they can get access to it quickly. And in fact, we've seen lots of changes over knowledge management over the last 15 or 20 years where initially knowledge management was all around sort of data centric, it was all we'll build these huge great databases and people can mine them and so on. Then we moved to sort of system based knowledge management. And now knowledge manage management is much more around people centric knowledge management. It's around how can I find the people who know the right or, or get the implicit stuff that's in people's head out tacitly in some way, sorry, the tacit stuff that's in someone's head implicitly uh, out, uh, uh, explicitly out, sorry. So, and lastly, they've had thousands of hours of independent experience and practice. Uh, there's, uh, again, Robert Winston talking about the fact that everyone can learn, get to grade eight in music with plenty of practice. Sure, we're, you know, we're not all going to be uh, top, top level musicians, but we can get to that with, with practice. And in fact, we all need experience and practice. And reflection, and one of the things that surprises me is many organisations, we don't create the opportunity for people to practice, and we certainly don't create the, the opportunity for, pe for people to reflect. So let me just share a couple of, uh, of examples, of practical examples of embedding, embedding learning. Uh, through sharing tacit knowledge, we can embed learning. Tacit knowledge is actually best developed through conversations and social relationships. I remember about 10 or 12 years ago when Nigel Payne was uh, the head of people development at the, uh, at the BBC, having a conversation. Nigel called me up just before Christmas and the BBC was about to downsize. I think it was going from 26,000 people down to 20. And he said that the Director General had asked him to map out a plan in order to how to capture all that experience and knowledge of the people who were going to uh, there was going to be a voluntary redundancy and most of the people who would take voluntary redundancy would people, be people in more senior roles who'd been there for a long time, a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And Nigel was, what was put on Nigel's plate was uh, how do we fix this? However, the Director General and the senior team at the BBC had asked Nigel about two months or a month before the announcement was be, to be made. Now, I'm, you know, it's really too late because what they should have been doing is setting up ways in which people could extract and share their knowledge and their learning through conversations and social, uh, and social relationships. There are other ways as well. I've seen uh, good examples where uh, people have, uh, are sharing through setting up wikis, getting experts to input all the content or actually putting the content and getting experts to correct it, assess it and correct it and capturing that tacit knowledge in, in that way. I've seen, I've seen various organisations do that. Then we can embed through other social and particularly performance support tools. The BBC had great success with a performance support tool where they were trying to improve, and goodness knows didn't they need it, to improve their, their, their customer uh, satisfaction in terms of when someone ordered a new service from BT they found that there were huge numbers of errors that were entered along the way, and any, many of us will know, know the problem. You know, you order a new line or a new whatever, new service, and something gets cocked up. Uh, they introduced a, uh, rather than training their, uh, their people, their order management people and so on, they in fact put a performance support system in place. And you can see the figures here. Mm. Uh, they, they reduced their training costs. They decided not to, tra to try and train people down to task level. They just provided that performance support. Uh, so people could get, who were, uh, who were dealing with these orders and, and answering uh, customer questions, they could get access to those quickly. They took the training costs down and 
More importantly, they took or increased the right first time orders by 60%. Now, the bottom line was that they took 10 million, about 10 million pounds out of the costs, but the, the major point was that they raised the, the, uh, the customer satisfaction levels were raised. <coughs> then one really simple way to embed learning is through the use of the simple checklists. And I think uh, I just want to give you, I want to finish up with just a couple of uh, examples of where checklists have really been shown to be very, very successful. Many of you will remember uh, the US Airways Flight 1549, the, the plane that took off from LaGuardia, uh, was just airborne and ran into a flock of geese, lost all power, and landed in the Hudson River. No, uh, there were no fatalities. Very unusual for a, a passenger airline to, to crash uh, once it's in the air and no fatalities. And I really would recommend just going onto YouTube and doing a search for, for uh, 1549 and listening, listening to the audio of the interaction between Sullenberger, particularly the captain, and uh, LaGuardia uh, flight control. It's really very interesting because Sullenberger was a very experienced pilot. He'd flown, I think, 15,000 hours in this Airbus. Uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Skiles was on his first flight on this aircraft. He, he was an experienced pilot, uh, pilot, but he was actually flying his, his first flight on an Airbus. And it's really interesting. If you listen to that audio, Sullenberger went through a checklist. And that sometimes he was just ignoring what was being told to him. He was ignoring the, the, all the messages and stuff that was coming back from the... Uh, uh, from the uh, control tower, he was simply working through a checklist, working out if he did this, what would happen? If he did that, what would happen? If he did the next thing, what would happen? And simply making decisions. They had three minutes from the time those, uh, get, they hit those geese until they hit the water. So in three minutes, he had gone through his checklist, he'd worked out what would work, what wouldn't work, and what options he had. And the outcome was, you know, he lost a plane, but he saved 100 and whatever people. So. I think the, the checklist is a really critical way in which we can embed learning with work. And, and uh, uh, this book I'm writing with is uh, uh, this Dutch chap, which uh, is around 100, it's called 110% performance, 70, 20, 10 and beyond, due to be published first in Dutch and then in English in the middle of this year. Uh, we've looked at this and there's a lot of work around checklists in that. So I think that this, the humble checklist is really very powerful. Another good example of checklists is uh, uh, Atul Gonadi, who some of you may have heard, he gave the Wreath Lectures last year. He's done a huge amount of work around the use of checklists, particularly in surgery. He's been working here in the UK. He's, a, he's American, but uh, uh, been working with the NHS and various NHS trusts here in the UK. And his work has shown that the use of the checklist can overcome all sorts of problems, of high, particularly in, in surgeries, over hierarchical problems where errors are made and they're not corrected because someone doesn't speak up or, or someone doesn't, doesn't uh, you know, because something goes wrong. And a very, very simple checklist. And his, his approach to checklist is keep it very, very simple. Don't give me a checklist of three pages. Give me a checklist of five things and let's work through that. And the basis of that is that most errors that are made actually not errors of ignorance. In other words, not because people don't know, but errors of ineptitude. Because we make mistakes because we don't make proper use of what we know. So I'd just like to finish off on that point because I think that's really critical. Rather than think, thinking about how we help our people to develop knowledge, what we should be doing is giving them access so that they can find what they need and they can use it in context. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about these other ones. I'm going to run, run, run to time, right? Good. Thank yeah. you very okay. much. I could, talk about, I could talk about others uh, such as this one here that I was involved in when I was at Reuters where we made huge savings by using uh, performance support tools, but I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Me. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Tristan Dahler uh, from Virgin Media, and I want to talk about our 2014 management 
uh, development story, which is a story which is very much underpinned by whether we call it the 3E model or the 70-20-10 model. So what I'm going to talk about really resonates and brings to life some of what uh, Charles will talk about. I've got 10 minutes and the chair has set the precedent that I've got 10 minutes. So I'll, uh, I'll talk quickly, but hopefully kind of cover what the main points I want to talk about. So what I do want to talk about is kind of why did we do it? What's our success? What medals were we kind of looking to, to get? What our journey is has been over the last year, and that's going to be where I'm going to spend the main chunk of, of the time today to talk really practically how we've applied and taken uh, our management development journey from mostly the 10 to bringing in certainly lots of the 70 and moving into the 20 into this year. Share with you some of our learning. So we've learned a lot along the way and share some of the key nuggets of our learning and also talk a little bit about what I see our future being. So the Management Academy is really our, uh, our, our brand of how we deploy all of our management development offerings, whether that be facilitator-led learning. We still use the 10, but we're really mindful when we use it whether that be through video content, online learning, or actually, as Charles was talking about, that kind of pull just-in-time learning, um, uh, main, spend a main chunk of time talking about that. Because as we know, learning is moving away from what you know, but be moving towards being able to access what you need at the time for the task in hand. And the role of, of being a manager in, in a complex organisation like Virgin Media and many of your organisations is one which requires lots of different skills and tasks. So why did we kind of set out to do this in the first place? Well, we, we, we looked, we did some analysis and we kind of got, we kind of realized that well, our managers needed to be better and more effective at doing some of the kind of fundamental elements of the role. We needed to bring together, what we really had the vision to do was to bring together in one place the, the resources and the tools to be able to do the task and also point people to further resources uh, which would help people with the skills to do that task. And in doing so, change our approach with learning being away from the classroom and more, happening, more of it happening in the workplace, which we all know is where it's most effective. So at the beginning of 2014, there were storms. If you remember that, how, how things change, we had lots of classroom training. Uh, that classroom, the classroom training was, was there was too much, frankly, of, of management development happening in the classroom, and it was a little bit of the, in more in that traditional sense. So, for example, our manager induction was three days where managers came in and they learned a lot of how to do stuff. We've stripped that down to to, to a one day offering. Uh, now where, where we spend a lot more time looking at sort of hearts and minds and the role of a manager and, and people to kind of really engage in their role. We also knew that we had a really decent LMS which is brought to us through Cornerstone and we also had some online learning but it was very much in that traditional linear way of learning where it's kind of click next, click next, click next which doesn't fit in with that pull just in time learning. Where do I get those resources I need to do my job? So we looked at our virgin values and we felt that we could do better. So we wanted to build systems that fueled insatiable curiosity for our managers to kind of get what they needed when they needed it. We wanted to make learning straight up, make it easy to access. That's our straight up's our way of kind of saying simple. We wanted to bring in some smart disruption around how we do learning. And we also wanted to touch, uh, in, introduce a bit of virgin red hotness. Uh, which is really important to us to make our learning kind of sexy. Am I allowed to say that? Done it. There you go. So I'm not, I I'm not, haven't got time to go through all of these today, but these are, so when we kind of started, 6th of January, I stepped into this role of kind of looking at the manage, management development offering in Virgin Media. When we started, these were some of the key questions we faced into really early on, and we had to kind of work through how are we going to wrestle with each of these. I'm going to be around afterwards. I'm around all day. I'm happy, if any, to sit down and have a coffee with anyone and talk through how we did, what, what decisions we did make. So... We find ourselves in January 2015. There are still storms going on. So as I said, we, 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 bought, we still have learning in classrooms. We still bring people into instructor-led training, but it's a lot less. And when we get people into rooms, we're not showing them how to. It's about engagement. It's about hearts and minds. It's about making people feel something in a classroom. I talked about our manager induction before. We now ask all of our new managers to do three things. 
to go out on a truck roll with an engineer, to go and visit a call centre and to go and spend half a day in a stall, a stall? In a store, a Virgin Media store, so they can experience, um, uh, learn through experience. And also, to, to what Charles was saying earlier, we've also purposefully enabled the 70 by creating this platform called the Management Academy, which brings together those resources of, um, of, of, of how-to how -to tools and also associated uh, 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 learning and skills development. So the bit I'm going to focus on today, because it really resonates with the 70-20-10 element, certainly the 70, is the toolkit. And uh, that's, as it would suggest, it's the tools to do your job and it's the, tool, and it's the skills to be able to uh, become better at doing those tasks. Each, the toolkit's got three sections, uh, build, setting clear direction, building a high performing team, overcoming challenges and communicating effectively. So it's a journey, you will see some of those pages saying coming here soon. Managing absence is coming by the end of this week, tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so we are constantly evolving the content in there. We wanted to keep it simple. So when a manager goes there, these are kind of the key elements of tasks to do their role. We felt fitted in to each of those four uh, categories. I'm going to spend just the last couple of minutes looking at the managing performance page that's in the toolkit. This is a really good example of how we've brought together process learning, the Virgin Media performance management process, and also getting people to widen their thinking that performance management isn't just a process, it's actually something that is done day to day. It's about behavior, it's about what you do as a manager and how you role model. So in there, we've got some stuff which is around the performance management cycle. So this is really good so for, new, for new managers, whereas talking to them in a the classroom about it when they first arrive and it kind of disappears out of their head, they actually can go, we really drive our induction around this and they can go and kind of learn what their key responsibilities are in the PM cycle. We've also brought in some, um, some resources which people can kind of grab and go and get stuck, they can grab and go is kind of high level, get stuck in is a lot more information around our performance rating scale and it talks about, it talks about some of the indicators you'd expect to see at those different levels of performance. And as I said, also widens people's views by bringing in, we've also got this kind of resource ebook, which has got videos in there, it's got case studies in there, and talks about things like differentiating performance, looking at motivation, touching on the psychology of the motivation, how you use objectives to drive performance at different levels, how to manage performance at different levels, and also around how to use reward and recognition to improve performance, per, 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 per people, individual performance. We've got a video, because some people like to learn through, through seeing how it's, how, how great, what great looks like. So we've got a video of a really good example of a performance discussion, and, uh, Working with suppliers such as Good Practice here and also in other places on the page, we also then link to external resources, TED Talks, uh, stuff through Good Practice, um, except, uh, Skillsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we are seeing, since it's early days, kind of four months in from August, what we are seeing is we're seeing healthy, healthy uh, access to the sites. We're also, to the, to the site, we're also seeing that when we land comms, talking about task and then, and then um, talking about using, going to the toolkit to pull on those resources to help them do the task, we see peaks in, in, in that. So it, it does suggest that, uh, it's at early days, but it does suggest that that kind of bringing together task and learning is, 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 effect, is, is working for us. I guess if I was, if I wanted to speak to someone, going back to when I started this role in January, these are the key learnings, I guess, we've done over this year and stuff I'd like to have known then. One minute, great. So we under, again, chat these through over coffee, we underestimated the difference in terms of L&D skills required. So that's probably my biggest learning. It required quite a fundamental shift in mindset and skill set of, of, of our learning and development team. We needed our people team colleagues to be involved in shaping and landed it. So it's been really collaborative across, across the people team. We've, we've worked with lots of different people to do that. Rather than just talk about it, we needed to um, show. As I say, my name's Pam Malkin and I'm from 
Scottish Power, we are, I want to take a couple of minutes to put our organisation into some context for you. We are a world leader in renewable energy and we have an employee base about 33,000 and I represent the UK about six and a half. Now, very like many people here, our business is very diverse. We've got from the generation holdings, our distribution and transmission, our retail and, and corporate environment. And each of those business areas have a very different view of embedding learning in the, the workplace. And what I'm going to do in the next couple of 10 minutes is actually share our journey with you of what we've done within that. In terms, as Tristan says, we're, we're on a journey. And one of the key drivers for ourselves was uh, our engagement survey. The results from our engagement survey indicated there was confusion around informal and formal learning. And some of the themes that actually came out that was, I don't get any training, although we had actually spent 499,000 hours last year actually doing training. So this gave us a platform to actually rethink and say, we have a problem here. And like everyone else, that 10% in terms of the, uh, our training budgets were getting squeezed and also around the fact that we are, as an organization, had a new generation of employees that were actually joining our organization. We've had a huge, uh, recruitment campaign around apprenticeships and in terms of those people these people were actually brought up with in technology so their expectations of training of what was formal and informal was very different from some of our 80 uh, percent of our employee base has been there for a long time so we had a problem and in terms of what what we did was we looked at what are key messages that we need to do uh, deliver? And Charles had talked earlier about induction and we actually took a decision that this was a great opportunity to exploit that informal and infor uh, formal and informal at the induction. And we have a marketplace where we actually take people through in a very informal way around what is this 70-20-10. This is the model or framework that we actually use. And one of the key things that I would say is use language that is simple to the business that they would understand. Before, one of the key things that we've, we've learned is when we actually have developed anything new, we would go out and we wouldn't involve any of our subject matter experts or people in the business. So what we've done in the actual 10% is at the business training plan cycle, we have spent a lot of time actually educating our people in our business around how to maximize their training budgets around the 70, 20, 10. That was a huge investment for us, but with doing that, what we've done is actually ensure that their training plans have a blend, a mix of that 70, 20, 10 throughout it. So that the 10% that they're actually using, they can actually concentrate on key operational projects, but also the actual tr transformation of change for their business area. The 20%, We've tried to do that through various networking for forums and we've encouraged that through our graduate community and ensuring that there is a platform should they, they have any questions around what that means for them going forward in their future career path. In the 70%, this was an opportunity for us to exploit something very new. And Tristan has already explained from his business area about the toolkit. We have a similar toolkit, and this is something that we're tracking at the moment. This was an opportunity for us to do something back to the people in terms of them taking ownership of their career. Over the last two days, there's been key messages around self-development. Self and we've used this platform, but in a very different way. 
And we've worked with each of the comms in the business areas to actually see how can we actually implement this toolkit in your business area. And they, we worked very closely with champions within that and they helped us actually sell that to their business areas and their utilisation when we went out to launch was about 99%. We are actually moving to a new dynamic platform this year in, in March. And one of the things that uh, we were challenged when we actually launched the toolkit like Tristian was, it was only applicable to people that actually had internet access in our organization. But we're actually moving to the dynamic platform, which will allow them to actually access this from home and through an iPad, et cetera, and through either smart smartphones. In terms of launch, it, the time of launch was very important for us. And we, we launched it when we were during the performance management cycle. We knew we would get resistance around this type of medium of learning because historically it was the 10%, the, the classroom base. But what we did was we actually used performance is something that would be applicable to everyone because everybody wants to make sure they get a good mid-year or end of the year performance review and that in terms of those people that had bonus, they got the right bonus. However, that didn't work for all of our business because in our generation holding business, they were going through a pay negotiation and they went, if you, if you crack up and you actually talk about performance, you'll lose your audience. And that was what we did with our business comms people. We actually worked with them and said, right, what is going on in your business area? Tell us something. And one of the key things was around a lot of that business area was due pre-retirement age. So there was things in our toolkit that actually would help those employees actually execute you know, their employment and go on to further employment should they, should, should they want. Another, another thing that um, has helped us actually embed this is around the testimonials. We're, we have constantly asked for feedback and sold the message of the people as, as opposed to sold the message of HR or learning and development. This is an example of where we're actually been doing that. And this is in our manager direct. We try to uh, communicate the 70-20-10 and our development toolkit, but in various uh, mediums. And this is something that is growing and the demand and uptake for this is approximately about 80% of managers in our business are actually logging on onto our manager direct. It's like a WebEx. It can actually answer any questions or any mis understandings around the 70-20-10 the model and we have a, a specialised team that know our toolkit and are able to answer those questions as smartly and as effectively as they can. So that's where we are on our journey and like Christian it's an exciting journey. I think our new dynamic platform will actually um, be a success. But one of the key messages that I will leave you with, if you're going to invest in anything like this, you need to engage the business. You need to look for your champions because they are the key people that will help you drive this through your business and get the utilization and be effective. So over to yourselves for some questions yeah. and answers. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. Right, do we have any questions from the audience? We have, oh, all on this side to start off with. Let's go. David. Thanks, all. Yeah, so, uh, yeah um, it's a basic one, really. Um, increasingly, in the knowledge economy, we've got a, a highly, massively distributed workforce. And, you know, it's great when you've got everybody in a couple of offices uh, spread across a couple of sites. Virgin Media, now part of uh, Liberty Global, Indeed. I think it is, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scottish Power with, you know, uh, 33,000 workers, I think, worldwide, 6K in the UK. I mean, how on earth do you keep it real? I think key word for me there was engaging. Obviously, that's mm. part of it. But um, people have got their own... Uh, preoccupations when they're sitting at home, you know, cat jumping on the keyboard, this kind of stuff. So how do you keep it real and, and really keep the attention there, um, get them engaged and get them responding? 
So how do we keep the attention? Who wants to go first? I, go yeah, I think for our organisation, one of the key things is actually the testimonials. People that actually have got value out of it, firmly believe it, and who are influencers of their own business areas. If you can find these people, and if you can convince these people and understand the various different, the, the framework, then you're on the right, you're on, you're on the right journey. And you need to, uh, in the 20%, hook them up with other people that may not necessarily have that mindset. Well, I would say sim similarly to uh, just keep talking about it, but we've got a content and functionality roadmap. So rather than doing everything in one go, we've kind of gone out with version one, but we're going to add different, I kind of alluded to some of it, where we're going to have like a dating site where you can book a date with someone to go and <laughs> learn from someone. Um, that's what we hope happens. Anyway, it's learning, learning dating. We're going to be putting sort of talking heads in there. So kind of Vox Pops and our leaders as teachers and have kind of our leaders running sessions in there. So I think it's, it's, about, it's about content and functionality and, and it constantly evolving and changing. Charles, from, from your perspective, what sort of advice would you give people to, to get that business involvement? Well, I think there's, there's an overarching, which actually touches on what both of you said, there's an overarching challenge which has to be met. And that is, how do you engage your team leaders and your managers to understand their role in terms of encouraging people to learn through work. And the way I tend to do this when I'm talking to senior management teams is I've done a lot of work over the, over the last few years with the corporate executive board who do a lot of uh, research with, amongst their members. It's a big American organisation. Many of your organisations may be members. And uh, I was involved uh, with some research 10 years ago where we identified through various instruments, 360s and, and uh, annual performance reviews, we've identified, identified managers who were seen, deemed to be effective and focused at developing their people, and those who were deemed not to be, to be not effective and not focused at developing their people. And the corporate executive board crunched the numbers. And uh, they showed that, that those managers who have that focus and are effective at encouraging and supporting development in all its forms, those, the, te the teams are brought into those people, outperformed others by about 20, well, they ran the, ran the surveys twice. 25% was the first figure, 27% was the second. Now, I always, I always just present that when I sit down with a group of managers. I say, here's the proposition. How would you like everyone in your organization to do an extra day's work a week? No catch. <laughs> no more effort from you, no requirement from the organization, no more, nothing extra from them. How would you like that? And of course, it's motherhood and apple pie. And the answer is, there's the data. If you can encourage and support your managers to support their people, that's going to be the output. Of course, every organization wants that. And then finally, I, I, I ask the question about usually around, do you have a, a competence framework? Most organizations do. In that competency framework, when we look at managers' competencies, do you have developing others as a competency? Most do. And then I ask the question about how do you assess managers for example, is that tie, when they have when a manager or a team leader has their performance review, do you assess their ability uh, or their performance in terms of developing their people? And even more, do you bonus your managers on developing their people? I have come across a couple of organisations that do that, but not very many. So I think that there's a whole big area that learning and development has a role in terms of how do we do that and it's not an easy answer it's a tough one and it's a long sometimes can take a long time and i think both of you have said getting champions is the key i think that's the absolute key that if you can get senior people who are champions and understand this that's where you start and then you can drive it from there Fabulous. Right, we had two more down here and then we'll go over to this side of the room we've got plenty of time for for questions Hi, I'm Karen Gallagher-Barton from the UK Defence Academy. We do a lot of leadership and management training. I noticed that from your presentations, you touched on the management training side. Do you uh, split out your leadership training? And if so, how do you do it? In our organisation, we, uh, in terms of our leadership, is managed by our, our capability team, which is part of a, a global team. 
However, in terms of the interventions that we use there, there is actually have, there's got to be alignment, right? In what we do from a senior level, right down to your first time managers. But my area is responsible for middle management and down another department is responsible for senior, seniors, uh, seniors and, and global, global leaders. So it is split. Yes, in our first time uh, people leader program, the, the first module is into leadership. And that covers what is the difference between leadership and management and the tools that, that go with each. Right, so that's, that's the first program that they'll, they'll actually do. Tristan? Same up. It would be almost a carbon, co almost a carbon, <laughs> carbon copy. Co answer. We were talking earlier about that. We were talking about it earlier. Absolutely, there is differentiation between the levels from if you look at it from pockets of learners. Um, but I think the key thing is that you're, commun you're embedding the same behaviours at those different levels. So it's almost like a kind of translation. So if I, an example, a really easy example to look at is strategy. If you take a member of the board, their role is very much to shape the strategy down to a kind of director level, which is to influence and inform that strategy to a head of department, which is to kind of make the strategy happen. And then you start working down um, and then you look at sort of the, sort of the middle and frontline managers, it's around translating that strategy in a meaningful way to the majority of the people. So that's an example of how strategy is a really good one to kind of look and see that it's the same kind of competency, but actually it's around strategy, but different levels have different parts. I think the other thing to say as well is it's really important to look at leaders as learners as well and say that they kind of have that sort of right to be in a, to be in a, a, a group, in a cohort with their peers and learn from each other as well. Charles, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think we'll pick up some other questions. Okay, I think there's, right. There's... More questions, more questions. Two ladies here. Come on, this side of the room's doing better at questions than over there. I need some questions from over there, please. Um, well, my, my name's Helen Fuller. I, I work for a pharmaceutical company. And much as we get the idea of, of 70 20 10, it's always the implementation that's quite difficult. Um, I was very interested, Tristan, in what you were saying uh, about underestimating the difference in terms of the L&D skill requirement mm -hmm. to try and make this live. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit and just say how you met some of those challenges. So I think we're still facing into some of those challenges. Um, I, a couple of examples, I guess. If we look at design, how we design, there's a, very, there's a difference between the design where you're, the learning is linear so you very much have a control over what the next step of that learning process is versus pull, on, pull learning. Well, I guess what we're kind of finding is that, that yes, yeah, that skill set's massively different. Right down, even down to the wording you would use on a on a on a web page, um, like you saw today, and what resources you have, what kind of images do you have, what what format do you deploy learning, whether it be video, kind of graphics, which do stuff. So there's a whole chunk which is around taking a design team, which is which is spent most of their time building in the historically classroom and um, and linear online learning to this pull approach of learning that I've demonstrated today. So that's kind of one example. If we take um, if we take without going into the structure of our T&D department, we also have T&D BPs. It's kind of the journey we've talked about today around 70, 20, 10, is, is about bringing those guys on that journey so that when talking to stakeholders around what the right solutions are, they're talking, all the stuff we've heard today is kind of saying that learning doesn't just have to be in the classroom. There's a variety of different options that are available. What I think is really important in those situations is to, is to make those resources as accessible as, and easy to get hold of as possible. Um, so a big part of what we've done to enable that's been content curation. So I kind of mentioned um, uh, good practice, uh, some of the some of our suppliers, TED Talks, etc. It's bringing bring it into one place, so it's really easy to get hold of. And I, I guess another example would be that our deliverers. It's around our deliverers moving away from let me give you the answer to actually let me show you how you can get your hands on the answer. So we're kind of like facing, we haven't solved that problem completely and we're facing into it, but we're moving forward significantly in that. And I would support Justin in that, but one of the other things that I would probably add is about, about commercial awareness. 
how, how um, your learning and development team, how commercially aware are they in terms of the business, that, the, the operations in your business? And if it's not part of their objectives, I would make it part of their objectives because to talk with substance, to understand and get that buy-in, you need to understand your business and where, you, where we can add value. Charles? Yeah, I, I just reflect what, what's said, but I think that, that that change, because it is it is a significant challenge in terms of learning professionals, because most of us in in the profession uh, have, have been for years, we've Absolutely. become experts Indeed. at designing, developing and delivering content in packages, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it requires a new skill set, but also it requires a new mindset. And for me, that's the major, and I've done quite a lot of work with, in fact, I've worked with companies like Danon who are doing some great work in this, in this area, the big French company that make Activa and, you know, and Evian Water and so on, uh, with their teams, because I think we shouldn't under underestimate that, because it's, uh, it's asking people to do things differently, and people need to be supported to do that. And just to take one simple example, uh, moving, for example, from training needs analysis to performance analysis. <coughs> now, it sounds very simple, but actually it's, it's asking people from rather than doing, gathering the data and going around and doing the traditional, you know, what do you need, what training do you need next year and so on and so forth. It's, it's then putting on a consultancy hat and going in to examine what the root cause of performance problems are and then doing the analysis in terms of what is going to have an impact. Now, those skills don't come naturally to us and many of us have not had the experience in that. So I think there's a major, major challenge. Uh, it's certainly surmountable. I've seen organizations that have really overcome it very well, but don't underestimate it. Mm. Make sure that you, and you can do it through the right recruitment, you can do it through the right development. Uh, Nigel Harrison, who I don't think is here this year, but has been at this conference a number of times, who mm. has worked with many big companies around using his seven step mm. A performance consulting model has seen lots of you know powerful impact in that so i think that uh, that is a major challenge I, I always say that there are three levels there is the absolutely enrollment of senior leadership getting senior leaders to understand that we're moving in this direction and that we're going to develop our people in a more effective way which is much wider and so on so senior leadership engagement it's the enrolment of managers, making sure that managers understand the impact that they can have. And I'm afraid, folks, managers can have far greater impact in terms of improving the performance of their people than learning and development HR ever, ever can. So we need to need them to work with them. And lastly are the L&D teams. So we need to actually empower and, and equip to, to be able to support all of these things. As you say, you know, content curation and, and uh, community management and all this sort of thing, which requires, I mean, I, I was running online courses in the early 1980s. And, you know, it, it's really damn difficult to, to build a community, to help a community build. It really requires a lot of time and effort and, and skill to a certain extent to do that. All right, we've got a question on the other side of the room. Go for it. Yeah, my question is very much in line with what the formal question was, and it's much about what you are talking about now. And I wondered what kind of support did you get on these things that are difficult for learning and development people or for to reach these things that you uh, mentioned? Like what kind of external, did you get any consultancy or system development assistance? What, what do you need? And what was useful for you in your experience? Yeah. So, so I tried to get Charles <laughs> uh, uh, about what, six weeks, couple yeah. of months ago, but Charles was in Germany, so we got another guy to come. So we had a big train, training and development event, and we bought, so clearly the answer isn't an, an event, uh, but an event is a great way to kind of get everyone to, to mobilize everyone behind a vision. And we articulated a vision which is towards an academy structure uh, and underpinned by 702010, which the Management Academy version one is the first example. So we kind of brought those, uh, the whole of the 120 plus L&D guys together to talk about it where, uh, and talk about what we're, what we're doing. So there was an element of bringing people uh, to give them that kind of kickoff. We started to begin an activity, which we're kind of still going through, which are teams looking Fun different functions of an L and D to look at what does that mean? What does that mean to us? What does that mean to me? Uh, 
Uh, we're also, uh, and on the back of that, we're also now building a development plan. So for kind of incumbents, we're building de we're in sort of development planning period of the year, in sort of this beginning of the year. Um, uh, and we're looking to have development plans in place to erect for different areas of the L&D team. Um, and I think the final one would be that when, when we're looking in the future to kind of bring people in, then we would be recruiting against different criteria. So probably kind of four really practical stuff that we've done in the last few months. Pamela? Um, in our organisation, we have a very specialised team that's been in our business for quite a long time. So very much like Tristan, we are much smaller, our learning and development team, but we've actually worked as a team and fought through these challenges. So we've probably been an internal support of each other, of peers in learning and development because we're all very different in our team, but we complement each other. And uh, we had agreement, our, our director is fantastic, very knowledgeable in this are uh, arena. So um, our support from our director, but we didn't bring any external consultancy in to help us through that journey because we have been in the business a long time. So we knew where we got it wrong <laughs> and we knew which, what step change we had to make to to go start the journey of trying to make it work for a business. Thank I'll you. say one other thing. I think it's really important the language that that we use when talking to our business and to our L and D and to our L and D colleagues. So we know we're trying to kind of move away from calling it training to learning, which just happens to be in the classroom because that's the right environment for that particular element of learning, as I kind of alluded to before. So learning's learning, and it kind of, even without us, we all learn. <laughs> if there's no such thing as L&D teams, people still learn. Um, but it's the language and, what, and how we talk is really important in, in the day-to-day -day as well. So, if My advice would be not to underestimate the importance of that communication and that clarity, in fact, one organisation which is, I think has done this brilliantly and you would expect it that, that I work with is the Lego uh, Corporation. And Lego, you know, they, they really think about these things from sort of build it block by block, so to speak. Uh, but the way that uh, I work with the HR director and the, the leadership and, and management uh, development teams there, and they started out by simply defining a set of principles, which I thought was uh, what ended up was a very simple definition of this is what you can expect when you work for Lego. Uh, this, is what you ex this is how you can expect the organization to support your development. This is what you should expect in terms of your, your direct manager, in terms of what you should expect from your manager to support your development. And this is what we expect you to do. So it was very clear. And then underneath that, they, they produced a lot of little scenarios so that you could look and, and they'd pull out different roles and say, well, this is this sort of thing. And that was then distributed across the organization. So there was absolute clarity in terms of what was expected of you with respect to developing in your role and developing for future role, what was expected, what you could expect of your manager and what you could expect of the organization. And it almost gave people permission to say if they felt that they weren't getting the support from the organization or from the manager to say that. But equally, it, it made it very clear to them individually what was expected of them. And I thought that was a really good starting, getting those principles down and distributed across the organization, communicated really clearly, is a really good starting point because it gets everyone onto the same page to a certain extent. And just to complement what Charles is saying, in our, our development programs, that is the icebreaker which we actually start with in our programs, is what's in it for me, what's in it for the team that we're in, and what's in it for the organization. And that's some of our scene setting for a lot of our development programs. Mm. I think we've got another couple of questions down here. We'll have the gentleman first and then the lady here. Pincer movement of the, uh, <laughs> of the microphones. Hi, um, my name's Chara Balasubramaniam. I'm also from another pharmaceutical company. I think it's another pharmaceutical company. It might be the same one, but <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, it's a global company that I work for, so I know we're very much talking about the UK in, in both respects, the examples that we've seen. But what do you think are the kind of cultural challenges of working mm. within a global environment with people from different countries and different cultures and their acceptances towards 
concepts like social learning, for sure. example. Yeah. Uh, can I just pick that up? Uh, and it's, it's great. I, uh, Bella Subramanian, I can actually pronounce your surname because I've worked with someone with the same name. Uh, I'd often wondered about that, and particularly when I, when I worked for Reuters and then Thomson Reuters, I had, uh, uh, I had uh, learning and development teams in, in the Far East, and particularly in Beijing, and I'd had this sort of mindset that said, well, in China, learning is principally didactic. People come through schools in a very, very didactic sort of way and uh, very structured, and therefore it might be a, really, a real challenge. And in fact, I was in Beijing, uh, uh, and, and I went and had lunch with the, the head of learning for Walmart in, in China. And uh, she was a Chinese national. And she was explaining to me that they were using 70, 20, 10 very effectively. And I was really intrigued about this. And she said, actually, it wasn't an issue. It, was, it, it, it resonated and it worked very well. And it seemed to be that the corporate culture within the organization had quite an influence as opposed to national culture. So I would have thought that, just as an example, that would be a real challenge. And, and I certainly have not seen any vertical where this model hasn't applied. You pharmaceutical, there's quite a few pharmaceutical companies that use this. Uh, there's uh, uh, lots of banks that, that use it. Organizations, sometimes people say, you know, we're highly compliant. We need to, we can't do this. Well, actually, uh, the CIA use this sort of model, you know, are they highly compliant? Yeah, I, I was, with, <laughs> I was across, across in Cheltenham with GCHQ uh, at the end of last year. So I, 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 I've yet to find any type of enterprise where it can't be utilized. That's not to say it's easy, but it does, it does create, you know, it creates challenges, obviously. But uh, certainly the, the cultural piece, I, I, I sort of had an initial view that it would be really difficult in some cultures, but I've not seen that to be the case. So do you think it's more about the, um, not so much the culture of the countries, but more around the company culture and the corporate culture that kind of influences how open people are to discussing? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You know, if you work in a command and control organization, mm -hmm. very rigid, but uh, you know, you'll find it more difficult than if you, if you don't. Thank you. Uh, and you have to work through that. And that's why getting senior execs involved is really critical, because that can help break that. Right, we've got time for just one more question because uh, I don't want to keep you all back from lunch. Certainly not. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's on. Okay, so that's going to be me. Hello, my name is Fatima. I work for a video game company. I'm very much interested by on um, the on the job learning part, and I wanted to know if you have any good practices on how to capture and value that. Capture. <laughs> capture. <laughs> In terms of the 70 percent on the job, we have called that just-in-time learning, <clears throat> right? And in terms of where we've tried to promote that is around pre pre-event and, and post post event learning, and using the material on the like Christian's academy or academy is actually promoting that into that 70 percent of just in time and for people to see the benefits and the consolidation of that. So that's how we're doing it in our Acts organization. As a facilitator. Like. Yes. Mm. And, and, and for us, we went big bang in August. It was, it was actually August, September time, where we had uh, on our home site, big article, posters, videos sent to all managers from the uh, chief people officer, et cetera, et cetera. So we did go big bang. But what we're trying to do is uh, interweave communications about these resources into the day-to-day -day activity that managers have to do. Um, so, for example, we're about to go into setting objective season in the business. So we'll be talking about the content in the toolkit then. And so it's kind of quite uh, under the radar, soft, ongoing engagement plan rather than big bang. But when, to go to the point, we kind of the first question we were asked at the front here, when we add significantly new content and certainly new functionality, then we'll probably have a, well, we won't probably, we will have a relaunch of want of a better word because we're going out with something significantly different than what we went out with initially. Uh, if I if I got your question right in terms of how you share how you how you share that 
the content. Lots, of, lots of things are happening between people, right? They I mean, um, in the type of company I'm working in, they don't, they don't wait for us <laughs> sure. to, to, to help them develop themselves. I mean, it's a, it's, this is a Gen Y, it's average 30 sure. years old. Yeah. Yep. They just learn and share a lot together. Sure. So we have yeah. a super um, social platform and lots of things that are happening there. Yeah. But how can we capture all that knowledge, make sure it goes to the right people, make sure it is, um, yeah. uh, sure. we can capitalize on it, etc. Yeah, I thought that was a question. Uh, I, I'd recommend you go and have a look at uh, on YouTube. Uh, Danon, okay. I mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, have a, a tremendous program called One Learning a Day. Uh, it's all built on 70 20 10. Mm -hmm. And I was working with Danon just uh, last year uh, and defining tools that they could use. And in fact, they're developing an interesting little app, which is a sort of pull and a push app so that people can capture their one learning a day. And it's driven from the CEO. It's all very, it's, it's right sort of embedded through the organization. And then learning and development has a role of aggregating those one learnings a day and then distilling them down and then pushing them back out again. So people can just share them, but also L&D has a sort of a, a curation role in terms of doing that. And I think, I think Danon is doing a really tremendous, my experience is they're doing a tremendous job there. And we also, when I was working with them, we not only defined what was required in that, but also checklists for HR and L&D in terms of supporting it, and also sets of tools for, the, for team leaders and managers to support that so that everything was feeding through that, that whole One Learning A Day initiative that people were encouraged. And it, it seems to be working very well. Yeah. Thank and, you. And then I, th I think don't forget the, um, the, the early days of BT with their Dare to Share as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a fascinating yeah. project. Yeah. So I would yeah, yeah. recommend you go and have a look at that on, on YouTube as well. Right, lunchtime beckons. First of all, I'd like to have a huge round of applause for our panel today.